Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about area under a curve, also known as integrals. The other major idea in calculus is the notion of the integral, a way to find the area underneath some portion of a curve. Like the derivative, at first glance, this might not seem terribly useful. Of course, it's somewhat interesting to be able to know the area under a curve, but what can we do with it that has any real use? Turns out, a huge amount. It allows us to consider what a function has done in total over the span of some interval. For example, if we have a function that gives the velocity of an object, how fast an object is moving around, the integral will tell us the object's location. So the velocity of an object as a function, we can take the integral of that and we can get location out of it. Why is that? Well, velocity tells us motion, how fast we're moving around. Well, if we look at how fast something has moved around in total, that winds up telling us where the thing lands at the end, right? Motion looked over the long term. If we put all of the motion together, if we look at all it's done in total, all the motion in total, we wind up seeing where we wind up. We wind up seeing location out of it. So that's just one example of how useful integrals can be. Trust me on this. This is really useful stuff. Let's check it out. Consider if we had some function f of x that has the graph right here. We could ask what is the area between the curve and the x-axis on the interval going from a to b. So we can fill that in and the shaded portion that we've got right here represents that area. But how could we go about finding how much area that actually is? Let's look for some way to approximate it. And notice that there's sort of, that's what we did with derivatives as well. As well. What we did is we thought, is there some way to approximate close to what the slope is, and then is there a way to improve on that approximation, and then is there a way to say to basically see how, what that improvement will eventually go to in the long sort of infinite version, right? As we got closer and closer to being right up against it with the derivative, as h went to zero, we were able to see what it became perfectly, what the slope was in that instant. And we'll see sort of a similar idea as we work with integrals. All right, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, so let's start looking at our approximation. The easiest way to find area is with a rectangle, right? Rectangles are a great way to find area because it's so easy to figure out what the area of a rectangle is. It's simply width times height. Area is just width times height. So let's approximate the area under our curve with rectangles, right? We begin by breaking our interval into n equal subintervals. In this case, we've broken into n equals 4, right? Here's 1, 2, 3, 4 equal width subintervals. So we go from A to B and we break it into n equal width chunks. In each one of these subintervals, we'll base the height of each rectangle off of some xi in each subinterval. That is to say, we'll choose some horizontal location in the subinterval, and then we'll see what height does that horizontal location go to. That horizontal location as a point, what height is that point at? And then that is going to set the height of that rectangle for that subinterval. So, for the ith subinterval, we will use xi to determine that height. The ith rectangle has a height of f evaluated at xi. So, xi is the horizontal reference location we use to determine the height for the ith rectangle, right? For example, in our third subinterval, we might look at x three, the horizontal reference location for our third subinterval, we check and we see what height does that wind up going to, and so that would be f evaluated at x3, and then that determines the height for our third rectangle. So we use xi to determine the reference location, the horizontal reference location for our ith subinterval, which then determines the, hor the uh, height, the height for our ith rectangle. We use this xi to determine height by getting f of xi to tell us what that rectangle's height is. Now, there's a variety of ways to choose our xi, right? In any given sub-interval, there is a continuum. There are infinitely many different locations we could pick to be our x that we're going to choose, right? We could choose this location, but we could also choose this location. Or we could choose the location between them, or the location in between them, or over here, or at the very hard, far edge, or the other very far edge, or somewhere else, right? There's all sorts of different ways we could choose this. And notice the way we decide to choose our xi for each one of these subintervals, because the xi, that horizontal reference location, determines the height for that rectangle, it's going to affect 
affect the height of the ith rectangle because height is just f evaluated at whatever horizontal reference location we chose, our xi. By using a different method to choose our xi, we will get a different approximation for the area because we're going to change the height of that rectangle. And if we change the heights of all of our rectangles, we'll wind up having a totally new version for our area approximation. So we're going to now look at some of the most common methods to choose xi for creating the heights of our rectangles. Our first common method that we see is the leftmost point method, where we wind up evaluating the height of each rectangle by just evaluating where does the leftmost point get mapped to. How high is the left side of each subinterval? We can see an example of this right here. So what we do for our first subinterval, we look where would the leftmost point of that subinterval get mapped to. It gets mapped to a height of here, and so that determines the height of our entire rectangle. For our second subinterval, we look at the leftmost location here. It gets mapped to this height, and that determines the height of that rectangle. For our third subinterval, we look at this leftmost location, that determines that height. Our fourth and final, we look at the leftmost location, that determines that height. We're determining the height of each rectangle based on the leftmost location in each of the rectangles. Basically the same idea, but flipped, we can look at the rightmost point. We can say for each subinterval, what is the height that the rightmost horizontal location gets mapped to, right? For our first subinterval, we look at the rightmost location for that one. That winds up getting mapped to here, so that determines the height of our first rectangle. For our second subinterval, we look at the rightmost location in that one. That's here, so that determines the height of our second rectangle. For our third subinterval, we look at the rightmost location of that subinterval. That determines the height of our third rectangle. And for our fourth and final one, we look at the rightmost location, and that determines the height of that fourth and final rectangle. We're just looking at the rightmost horizontal location to determine the height for each one of our rectangles. We could also do this based on the horizontal midpoint. So, so far we've looked at the two extremes, the far left side of the subinterval and the far right side of the subinterval. But we could also ask what happens to the guy in the middle, right? For our first subinterval, we look at the guy who's in the middle of that. We go up and the midpoint gets mapped to this height, so that determines the height of that first rectangle. For our second subinterval, we look at the midpoint of that subinterval. We go up and that tells us the height for our rectangle here. For our third subinterval, we look at the midpoint, we see what height does that midpoint, does that horizontal midpoint get mapped to, and that determines the height of that entire third rectangle. And same thing for our fourth one. We look at the midpoint, what value does that midpoint get mapped to, that determines the height of that entire rectangle. So, so far we've looked at far left side, far right side, and the middle. But there's also another way of looking at this. We can also look at as the maximum height in each one of these. So we look at the subinterval and we see which one of these points gets mapped to the highest possible location. We look over the entire subinterval and we see who is highest in this portion. So in this case, the highest location we get for this subinterval is here, so that determines the height of the entire rectangle. For our second subinterval, the highest possible location we reach in this subinterval is this location right here, so that determines the height of that entire second rectangle. For our third subinterval, we see that the highest possible height we reach in that subinterval is here, so that determines the height of the entire third rectangle. And for our fourth and final one, the highest possible point we get is here, so that determines the height of the entire rectangle. The maximum height method is also sometimes known as the upper sum, because notice, by choosing the maximum height in each of our subintervals, we'll always wind up getting a approximation that is going to be at least the value of the area under the curve and more than that area usually, right? We can see all of the places that we've wound up going above it, right? And so we wind up having something that is above what we're actually going to wind up having as the area underneath the curve. And so we call it an upper sum because we're getting something that is above the value of the actual area underneath the curve. We can also talk about the minimum height for each one of our subintervals. We can look and see for our first subinterval who is the lowest possible height we have in here. We see that it's here, and so we wind up getting this as the height for it. We can also do this for each one of our subintervals. We can have our second subinterval. Our second subinterval, the lowest possible height in that second subinterval is right here. So we wind up evaluating that as the height of our second rectangle. For our third subinterval, the lowest possible height is right here. So that gives us the height of our third rectangle. And for our fourth and final subinterval, the lowest possible height over that subinterval is right there. And so that gives us the height of our 
fourth rectangle. This one is sometimes called the lower sum because it's always going to wind up giving us a value that is below the actual area underneath the curve because since we're choosing based on minimum heights, each of our rectangles is actually undercutting the area, right? We can see area that we're missing each time. For each of our rectangles, we're not fully filling out that area because we're always below it, so we wind up having less than the area that's actually underneath the curve, and so it's sometimes also called the lower sum. How can we find what this approximation actually winds up giving us? So how can we find this area? Well, first we want to figure out what the width of each one of these rectangles is. That's a little bit easy. That's the easier thing to figure out. We split the interval into n subintervals, right? That's how we did this right from the beginning, is we split it into n equal width subintervals. So what is the total length? of the interval we have, well, that's going to be b minus a, where we end minus where we started. So if we've split it into n equal width subintervals, the width of each one of them must be the total length divided by how many intervals we have. So our width is equal to b minus a divided by n. That is the width of one of our rectangles is b minus a over n. To figure out the height for each rectangle, well, the ith rectangle's height depends on the specific xi we chose for it, right? The different methods that we were just talking about. There's various different ways that we can choose that xi. But whatever xi we wind up choosing will tell us the height. So just by definition, our height is equal to f evaluated at the various xi that we chose. So with these two things in mind, we now have our width and we have our height. So the area for the ith rectangle, any given rectangle is going to be that rectangle's width, which is b minus a divided by n, times that rectangle's height, which was determined by the xi we chose, so our height right here. So the area of our ith rectangle is equal to the width b minus a over n times the height of that ith rectangle, which is going to be f evaluated at xi, whatever horizontal reference location we chose. If we want to figure out what the total approximation is, we need to add up each one of our rectangles, right? We aren't concerned with just one of our rectangles. We want to add up all of the rectangles in our approximation, so we sum them all up, and we can use sigma notation for that. So we've got i equals 1, our first rectangle, to n, the nth rectangle, which is our last rectangle, since we're using a total of n subintervals. And then we just wind up adding up the area from each one of these. So it's going to be b minus a over n, the width of each one of these, times the height of each one of these, f of xi. Notice that whatever method we choose to determine the height of the rectangles, the more rectangles we use, the better our approximation becomes. Over here we have n equals 4, but over here we have n equals 8. And notice in this second one, we wind up having a closer approximation. We've got sort of less missing chunks. The more rectangles we use for our approximation, the closer our approximation becomes to actually giving us the area underneath the curve. Thus, our approximation becomes ever more accurate as the number of rectangles n goes off to infinity. So as we increase our n value higher and higher and higher and higher, our approximation becomes better and better and better and better. So as our n slides off to infinity, we'll be able to get effectively what the perfect value is underneath that curve. With this realization in mind, remember, the approximation we just figured out for the area with n rectangles was the sum of i equals 1 up until n of our width for each rectangle, b minus a over n, times the height of each rectangle, f evaluated at its specific xi. And this approximation becomes more accurate as our n goes off to infinity, as the number of rectangles we have becomes more and more and more and more. We get a finer and finer sense of the area underneath the curve. So with that idea in mind, we take the limit at infinity to find the area underneath the curve. So the area under our function f of x from a to b, in that interval from a to b, is the limit as n goes to infinity, as our number of rectangles slides off to infinity, of our approximation formula, the sum from i equals 1 of n from i equals 1 to n of the width b minus a over n times the height f of xi. So it's the limit as our number of rectangles slides off to infinity of our normal approximation formula. If this limit exists, and it might not for some weird functions, but most of the functions we're used to, it will wind up existing. That, what it, that limit is, is it's called the integral, the integral from a to b. It is denoted with the integral from a to b, that's the integral sign there, that new sign you probably haven't seen before, integral from a to b of f of x dx. The process of finding integrals is called integration. So the integral from a to b tells us the area underneath the curve f of x from a to b, that interval a to b.
really cool stuff here. Here's the really amazing part. The integral from a to b of f of x dx is based on the antiderivative of f of x. That is, the derivative process done in reverse on f of x. So we talked about the idea of taking the derivative of some function, of being able to see some function and then turn it into another function that talks about the rate of change of that. For that, we had f of x became, through the derivative process, became f prime of x. But we can also talk about what if we did the reverse of this process. Instead of taking a derivative, we did the antiderivative, where we worked our way up the chain. And we symbolize that with the capital F of x. So capital F of x is the guy that you can take the derivative of it and it becomes little f of x. So capital F of x, the antiderivative, is the thing where if you take its derivative, you just get little f of x, the function that we're starting with, what's inside of our integral. So we can take the derivative process and reverse it, and we're able to start talking about the area underneath the curve. This is really cool stuff. Armed with this notation of capital F of x, it turns out that the integral of a to b of f of x dx, that is the area underneath the curve from a to b of some f of x function, is equal to the antiderivative of f evaluated at b minus the antiderivative of f evaluated at a. Wow, that is amazing. It's just like so incredibly elegant that there is this way to talk about the area underneath the curve with this thing that we just talked about that had a rate of change. And it seems really shocking that these things are connected at all. But it's absolutely amazing and it allows us to really easily find area for something that would be otherwise very difficult to work through that infinite limit that we were just talking about. So you might be wondering, why in the world does this happen? Why is there this connection between the area underneath the curve and this antiderivative where we're talking about what the height, the antiderivative of the height of it gives us the area underneath the curve? It seems really surprising at first. In short, what we can do is we can think of the area underneath the curve as being a special function a of x. Now notice, right, so we've got this area underneath the curve, the shaded portion, as being a of x. Notice that the rate of change for the area is based on the height of the function at any given location. So for example, if we consider this x location right here, how fast our area function is changing is based on how tall our function is in that moment. And how tall is a function? Well, that's just what you get when you evaluate the function, f of x. Notice if we'd gone to some other horizontal location, where we had a different height, we'd wind up having a very different speed that our area was growing at, right? If the height of the function is small, our area grows at a slow rate. If the height of the function is high, our area grows at a fast rate. So the height of the function changes how fast our area grows. How fast does something grow? Well, that's we're talking about rate of change. That means that height, since height is connected to area through rate of change, since height gives us the rate of change of area. Well, rate of change, that was derivative that we were just talking about. So height is the derivative of area because height is the rate of change of our area. That means that the reverse works as well. We can look at sort of the symmetric version of this. Area is based on the antiderivative of height, right? Since height is the derivative of area, that means area must be the antiderivative of height, right? Since we go one direction, if we go the opposite direction, doing the opposite thing, we get the other version. Since a prime of x equals f of x, that is to say the derivative of x equals little f of x. If we do the antiderivative of f, we wind up getting the antiderivative of a prime, which is just our area function that we started off with. If this is a little bit confusing to you now, and don't worry, it very well might be, and it'd be perfectly reasonable, just think about it when you wind up getting exposed to this new idea when you actually take a calculus class. This winds up being a fair bit of a way into calculus class, but I think it's a really cool idea. And now that you understand what's going on sort of intuitively, or at least have the seed ready to blossom at a future date. When you see it later, you go, oh, now I understand what that guy was talking about. It's now starting to make sense, and there's really cool stuff here. I really, really love this stuff, and I hope that you're getting some sense of just how amazingly beautiful all of this stuff in math is. All right.
let's start looking at some examples. Find an approximation to the area under f of x equals x squared from a equals 0 to b equals 3 by using three equal width rectangles, that is n equals 3, on the left hand point of each interval. So first thing, let's just get a quick sketch here so we can see what's going on. So f of x equals x squared, we just real quick sketch what we're looking at here, right? And so let's say here, you know, here is a equals 0, here is b equals 3. So if we're going to use three equal width rectangles, n equals 3, we're breaking it up into three chunks. And we're going to evaluate each one of these rectangles on the left hand point of each interval. So three equal chunks here. So if it's the left hand point, then that first one there, this one here, this one here, gives us the area for each one of these. And notice that that first rectangle won't have any area at all because we're evaluating at the left hand point of each interval. So first let's check and see what is the width. The width is going to be, since it is equal width for each one of these, how long is our interval? That's b minus a divided by how many subintervals do we break it into? n. So we have 3 for our ending location minus 0 for our starting location divided by 3 is the total number of subintervals. 3 over 3 gets us 1. So we've got a width of 1 for each one of these. So at this point we can go in and we can see where does these have our first location Subinterval will go from 0 to 1, the next one will go from 1 to 2, the next one, the last one, goes from 2 to 3. All right, with all this in mind, we can now see about evaluating each one of these rectangles. So our first rectangle will be i equals 1, our second rectangle, i equals 2, and our last final rectangle, i equals 3. So where will we evaluate our first rectangle? Well, that's the left hand point. If our First rectangle, remember, it's going from 0 to 1, right? 0 to 1 is the subinterval it's evaluating, 0 to 1. The left hand point is 0, so it's going to have a height of f at 0. What's the width? The width is 1, so 1 times f of 0. In general, notice that that's also just the same thing as saying the width, b minus a over n, times our function evaluated it however we determined our xi. In this case, we're determining based on left-hand points. So 1 times f at 0, our f of x equals x squared, so we've got 1 times 0 squared, which comes out to be just 0 for the area of our first rectangle, this guy right here. And we can see that it's going to have to be a completely flat, not really a rectangle, just a chunk of line because it doesn't have any height because we're evaluating at the left-hand side. For our second rectangle, once again, a width of 1 times the height will be evaluated evaluated at the left hand side here will be 1. So f evaluated at 1, 1 times 1 squared, that gets us just 1, so an area of 1 for our second rectangle. And our third and final rectangle, 1 times f evaluated at 2, because the left hand from 2 to 3 is going to be 2. 1 times f of 2, that's 1 times 2 squared when we evaluate that function, and that comes out to 4. So the total amount of area we get for our approximation, the total approximation we get is going to be equal to each of these added up together, right? The first rectangle, 0, plus the second rectangle, 1, plus the third rectangle, third final rectangle, each of our areas, 4 there, 0 plus 1 plus 4, gets us a total area of 5 for our entire approximation of a equals 0 to b equals 3, with three subintervals and the left hand point for each one. Our second example, very similar to our previous example, we're finding an approximation to the area under f of x equals x squared from a equals 0 to b equals 3 by using four equal width rectangles, n equals 4, on the maximum point of each interval. So the only real difference here is that we're now using four rectangles, and we're doing it based on the maximum point, the highest location for each one of these intervals. We draw in our curve x squared, so we've got something like this. We're going once again from a equals 0 to b equals 3, so there's our interval. And we're going to be looking for the maximum point of each interval. If it's four equal width rectangles, let's draw that in real quickly. One, two, three, four. So notice, the maximum point of each interval, where is that going to be here? Well, that's going to be here, right? Where is that going to be for this one? That'll be here. Where will that be for this one? That'll be here. And where for this one? That'll be here. Hey, maximum point for this guy is basically the same thing as saying the right-hand 
side. Now, I want to point out, this is not always true. As we saw when we were working through this lesson, right hand point, maximum, they can give us totally different rectangle pictures. However, for something like f of x equals x squared, where it's just constantly growing, constantly growing, constantly growing, since it's always growing as it goes off to the right, that means for any subinterval, the rightmost point will be at the highest height. So the rightmost point is the same thing as maximum for the specific case of the function x squared. With a different function, you might wind up having different things. So it's something you have to think about. But in this specific case, it'll be the same thing as just evaluating at the right hand side. What's the width of each one of these rectangles? Well, the width is b minus a over n. In that case, we've got a width of 3 total divided by 4 for each one. And let's put that in decimal for ease because we're going to wind up using a calculator to crunch these numbers because we'll have a lot of decimals showing up otherwise. So our very first horizontal location is 0 because we start at 0. The next one will be 0 0.75. We've got a width of 0 0.75. The next one will be at 1.5, because another 0 0.75 step ahead of that. The next one will be at 2.25, another 0 0.75 step ahead of that. And finally, we finish at 3, which makes sense. We have to start at 0 and end at 3, and we work by step after step of our width, 0 0.75, to make it up each time. Our first rectangle, we'll figure out the area for that one. Our second rectangle, our third rectangle, and our fourth rectangle. Okay, so our first rectangle, remember, right-hand point is the same thing as maximum point in the specific case of the function x squared. So what's the width here? The width is 3 quarters. Remember, in general, the area of any rectangle is the width times the height. So in this case, it'll be b minus a over n, because that's always going to be the width if we have n equal subintervals going from a to b. b minus a is the total length, divided by n for the width times the height of each one of them, our f evaluated at xi, and xi will depend on how we're choosing the point to look at. In this case, we're looking at the maximum point, which winds up being the right-hand point, so we'll always wind up looking at the right side of each one of these subintervals. Okay, back to our first one, 3 quarters, our width, times the height. Where does the height wind up getting evaluated? Well, if we're going from 0 to 0 0.75, that's our first subinterval, we're going to wind up looking at the most right-hand part, which is 0 0.75. So f plug in 0 0.75. 3 quarters times f of 0 0.75, that's the same thing as 0 0.75 times 0 0.75 squared, right? Since f is just x squared, just a squaring function, 0 0.75 times 0 0.75 squared. We work that out with a calculator, and we get 0 0.422. Great. Second rectangle, once again, we evaluate 3 quarters, the width times f evaluated now at 1.5, because the right side of this one, the right side of our second rectangle will be 1.5. Here was our first rectangle, now we're on our second rectangle, so its right side is 1.5. So 3 quarters times 1.5 squared. Work that out with a calculator, we get 1.688. Third rectangle, this one right here, the right side of that rectangle, the maximum height is 2.25. Still the same width. The width will never wind up changing because we set the width to be equal for all of them. So f plug in 2.25, the right side, 3 quarters. In this specific case, our function is square, so 2.25 squared. That comes out to be 3.797. And our fourth and final rectangle, width times the height that it evaluates at. That's going to be 3, because the far right-hand side of our final interval is 3. 3 quarters times f of 3. And remember, the right-hand side in this specific case happens to be the maximum. If you worked with a different function, you'd have to think about what's going to be the maximum location there. 3 squared, 3 quarters times 3 squared, that comes out to be 6.75. If we want to know what the total area approximation is, we add up all of these numbers, so it's going to be area equals 0 0.422 plus 1.688 plus 3.797 plus 6.75. We add up all four of the rectangles, and that tells us the total approximation we got by using this specific method, and that comes out to be 12. 0.657. So that's the total approximation we wind up getting here. Notice at this point we now have the lower sum and the upper sum. In our first example, we chose minimum because we chose the left hand side, and we wound up getting 5 out of that. At this point, we now have just chosen the maximum, so we got an upper sum, something that in the 
most that the area could possibly be, and we wound up getting 12.657. So whatever the actual area underneath that curve is, we know it has to be between 5, because that was the lower sum in our first example, and 12.657, because we just got an upper sum in this, our second example. So whatever the actual value, value of the area underneath that curve between 0 and 3 has to be somewhere between 5 and 12.657. Now, in our third example, we're going to actually figure out what it is precisely by taking an infinite limit. For our third example, find the precise area under f of x equals x squared from a equals 0 to b equals 3 using the limit as the number of rectangles n goes off to infinity. To do this, we'll also wind up needing this specific identity, the sum of i equals 1 to n of i squared equals n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all divided by 6, but we won't actually wind up using that until we get about halfway through this thing. So first, how do we set this thing up? Once again, just a quick picture to help us clarify things. So we've got x squared, and we're working our way from a equals 0 to b equals 3. Right? And we're going to wind up cutting it into some number of subintervals. We're going to wind up cutting it into n subintervals, and then from there we will let n go off to infinity. But we have to start off figuring out what would the area be if we had just some actual value for n, and then we let n run off to infinity. So first, what's our width going to wind up being? Our width will wind up being b minus a over n, because that's always the case. b minus a over n, in this case, a equals 0, b equals 3. So our width is going to be 3 divided by the number of rectangles we choose to use, 3 divided by n. That's the width of each one of these. Now we need to decide how are we going to determine where we choose our xi. It's going to wind up actually making our notation just a little bit easier if we choose rightmost, so we're just going to arbitrarily choose rightmost. I want to point out to you, though, it doesn't actually matter which one we choose, rightmost, leftmost, midpoint, upper sum, lower sum, if it does eventually converge to a single value, if our limit does exist as n goes off to infinity, then we'll have found the area underneath it. And no matter how we choose to set up our cuts and our heights, as the number of rectangles goes closer and cl farther and farther off to infinity, our area has to get closer and closer to the actual thing, no matter how we set up the heights, if it can get to an actual um, value under the area. So it doesn't matter which one we choose specifically. Rightmost is nice because it's easy to do it notation-wise, so if you wind up having to do a similar problem, you can basically just copy the method I'm doing here to set up, and it will wind up working for you in notation as well. All right, let's get back to this. So our rightmost, we'll set up our rightmost xi for each one. So what will xi wind up being? Well, our first xi has to be, uh, sorry, our first xi will be a is the far left side, so what would be the next one? Well, that would be a plus what's our width? Our width is 3 over n. 3 over n for the first xi. So in general, to get out to the ith xi, we start at a, and then if we are at the ith xi, we will be 3 over n as our width each time we go forward a step. How many steps did we take forward? i steps, right? If we start at a, and then we want to get to the xi, who's the far right side of any one, well, the first guy would show up at plus 1, 3n. The second guy would show up at plus 2, 3n. The third guy would show up at plus 3, um, sorry, 3 over n, 3 over, 2 times 3 over n, 3 times 3 over n. It's the number of steps times our width each time, 3 over n. So the number of steps that we've taken, if we're at the rightmost of each side, is just going to be i, whatever inner subinterval we're at. So if we're in our first subinterval, we've taken one width step to get to the right side. If we're in our tenth subinterval, we've taken 10 width steps to get to the right side of that tenth subinterval. So in general, xi is equal to a, our starting location, plus 3 over n times i. In the specific case of this problem, we can plug in what our a equals 0. So we've got xi equals 0 plus 3 over n times i, so 3 over n times i. So that gives us our xi for this specific problem. But if you were doing just any problem in general, you'd want to use that first part, a plus, and also you wouldn't use 3 over n, you'd wind up using whatever your specific width wound up being, which would be b minus a over n, not necessarily 3 over n. That's the specific problem we're working right here. All right, so if we've got xi for each one, what will wind up being the height for each one of our rectangles? So the height of ith rectangle is going to be f evaluated at xi, which is to say f evaluated at 3 over n times i. So in general, what we do next is we set up our limit, the limit as n goes off to infinity of our sum the approximation for n rectangles would be start at our first rectangle, i equals 1, go out to our last rectangle, 
n. And it's going to be the width of each one of these rectangles, b minus a over n, times the height of each one of these rectangles, f of xi. Now, this formula here will always wind up working for any problem that you've set up. So that's a useful thing to work with. Now we're going to start using what we've got in our specific problem. So we'll start plugging things in. Our limit is still the same. Our summation is still the same. We're going from the first to the last. Our b minus a over n, we figured that that was a width of 3 divided by the number of rectangles we chose, 3 divided by n, times f evaluated at xi. Well, what is f evaluated at xi? Well, f of x equals x squared. So if our xi is 3 over n times i, right? That was what we figured out our xi has to be. Then f evaluated at 3 over n times i is 3 over n times i squared. So 3 over n times i squared. And we've got that right here. We now plug that in. 3 over n times i whole thing squared. At this point, we can now simplify that just a little bit. And we've got the limit as n goes off to infinity of the sum i equals 1 to n, our first rectangle to our last, rec last rectangle. The squared distributes, we've got 3 squared over n squared times i squared. We've also got that 3 over n there. So we simplify that to 27 over n cubed times i squared. All right. So at this point, we're now ready to move on to the second half of this. We can now start working to figure out what does this infinite series wind up coming out to be. All right. So Continuing on with our example, we've got the area is equal to the limit as n goes off to infinity from i equals 1 to n of 27 over n cubed times i squared, whatever that winds up happening to be. And at a later point, we will wind up chucking this identity into the mix so that we can actually solve this thing out. All right. So the first thing to notice is that the 27 over n cubed part that doesn't actually do anything inside of the sum. The n, as far as the sum is concerned, is actually a fixed value. The n here is just a constant. Remember when we were working with sigma notation, the number on top was just some number. It didn't change around during the course of doing things. So since the n isn't changing inside of the sigma, it will change over here because n will go off to infinity. But as far as the sigma is concerned, it doesn't change. The limit has to do something. So since the sigma doesn't have anything happening, we can actually pull it outside of the sigma. So the first step here is to see that what we've really got is we can write this as lem limit as n goes off to infinity. We pull out the 27 over n cubed because it's not affected if it doesn't on the inside or the outside. It's effectively just a, it's just a scalar constant as far as our series here is concerned. So i equals 1 up to n of i squared. At this point, hey, look, we've got the sum as i equals 1 goes off to n of i squared. So we can now swap it out for this portion right here. So we swap it out for that portion right here. We've got the limit as n goes off to infinity of 27 over n cubed. And we swap out n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. Great. So let's work to simplify things out a bit. Limit as n goes off to infinity. We'll keep our 27 over n cubed off to the side for just a moment. So, well, let's actually, we'll put it into the thing, but we'll deal with this part first. So n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. Let's expand this a little bit. So we do a little bit of expanding. We have n squared plus n times 2n plus 1. All over n cubed times 6. Great. Limit as n goes off to infinity, we can finish expanding our factors there. We've got 27 times n squared times 2n becomes 2n cubed. n squared plus 1, n squared times positive 1, n times 2n gets 2n squared. So we've got a total of plus 3n squared, and n times 1 gets us plus n. All over 6n cubed. Limit as n goes off to infinity. We've got 27 times 2n cubed. That comes out to be 54n cubed plus 3 times n squared. That comes out to be 81n squared plus 27n, all divided by 6n cubed. All right, at this point, let's move this all up here so we can keep working on it. Notice that if we want, we can break this into two separate faction, fractions. So we've got the limit as n goes to infinity of 54 
n cubed over 6n cubed plus 3, whoops, not 3n squared, but 81n squared plus 27n all over 6n cubed. Now, this portion right here, the n cubed and the n cubed will wind up canceling out. So we've got 54 divided by 6. But as the limit as n goes off to infinity for this portion, well, we've got n cubed on the bottom, right? That's a 3 degree on the bottom. But on the top, we've only got n squared and n. So that's a 2 degree and a 1 degree. Those can't compete with an n cubed on the bottom. A degree of 3 on the bottom, that's going to wind up crushing that in the long term. As n rides off to infinity, our denominator is going to get so much bigger than our numerator that this whole part here just crushes down to 0. That means we're left, as our n goes off to infinity, with simply having 54 divided by 6, and 54 divided by 6 gets us 9. So the total area underneath that curve is actually precisely equal to 9. Pretty cool. Notice that it does take a little bit of challenging effort to work through this limit as n goes to infinity. We can work through it slowly, but it's not easy. We had to pull up this kind of arcane formula, right? It's not a very difficult summation formula, but it's not one that we probably know offhand. So this stuff isn't super easy to work with limit as n goes off to infinity if we're trying to do this infinite cut method. And that's why that fundamental theorem of calculus, that integral with antiderivative stuff, is so useful. Let's see just how powerful that is now in our final example of the course. Using the amazing fact that the integral of a to b of f of x dx is equal to the antiderivative of f evaluated at b minus the antiderivative of f evaluated at a. Remember, the integral is just the area underneath the curve from a to b for some curve defined by f of x. Find the area under f of x equals x squared from a equals 0 to b equals 3. So this part right here is the area that we are looking for. That's the area that we're looking for. So what we want to do is we want to figure out what is f of b, big F of b, minus big F of a. So big F of x is the antiderivative of little f of x. So the very first step we need to figure out here is what is the antiderivative to little f of x? So little f of x equals x squared. Little f of x equals x squared. When we worked through the derivative examples, we talked about the power rule, where you take the exponent and you move it down. So for example, if we have f of x equals x to the fifth, the derivative of x is equal to move that exponent down, move the 5 down. So we have 5 times x, and then we subtract 1 from the exponent, so minus 1 from it at that point, so it'll be 5x to the fourth. So there's this nice, easy rule for taking derivatives with the power rule. So if we've got x squared and we want to reverse the process, well, since it drops down by 1 each time we wind up taking a derivative, that means that the antiderivative must push our exponent up by 1, right? Since it goes from it will drop down 1 when we take the derivative, when we go to the derivative of big F of x. Remember, since big F of x, we can take the derivative of big F of x to just get little f of x, we have to have this relationship of our exponent dropping down when we take the derivative of big F of x. So the derivative of big F of x, that 3, must drop down to a squared, since 3 minus 1 will go down to 2. So we know that the exponent that must start there must be 3. However, if we were to work this out, we'd wind up getting x cubed. If we took the derivative of this, we'd bring the 3 down, and we'd get 3 times x to the 3 minus 1, or 3x squared. But there's this problem here. It's not 3x squared, it's just plain x squared. So how can we get rid of this 3 coefficient at the front? We just divide the whole thing by 3. So we divide the whole thing by 3, and now we have the antiderivative to it. Let's check and make sure that that works. So let's check. If f of x is equal to x cubed over 3, then what is the derivative of f of x? Well, it should turn out to be little f of x. So we've got this cubed exponent. We bring that down out to the front. So that's going to be equal to 3 times what we started with. x3 minus 1 becomes a 2. It's still divided by 3. 3 3 on the bottom, they cancel out, and we've got x squared, which is what we started off with. That checks out. Great. So now we've figured out what our antiderivative is. At this point, we can now actually use this portion of the formula. So big F evaluated at what's our b? 3. Minus big F evaluated at what's our a? 0. So big F of 3 minus big F of 0 antiderivative of our function evaluated at the 
far n minus the antiderivative at our starting location, the ending location minus the starting location. So what is our thing? It's x cubed over 3 is what our big F of x is. So we've got 3 cubed over 3 minus 0 cubed over 3. 0 cubed over 3, that just disappears. So we've got 3 cubed over 3, 3 cubed over 3, the 3 cancels this into a 2. The 3 on the bottom cancels our top exponent down by 1. We've got just 3 squared. 3 squared is 9. Nice. And that is the exact same thing that we got by working through that long infinite series method where we had the limit as n goes to infinity of this approximation. And notice how much faster this was than that previous method. And this was with like, carefully explaining a bunch of ideas that we've just seen the very first time. If you were used to doing this, when you get used to this method, you can fly through it. You can do it so much faster than trying to work through the limits. That precise formal limit method, that's something that you learn at the very beginning just so we can introduce this really, really amazing fact. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus. This idea is so important. It gets the name fundamental theorem of calculus. It's really cool stuff here. All right. That does it for this course. Uh, it's been a pleasure teaching you. I hope that you've not just learned how these things work and how to use them, but that you've also started to gain some idea of how math works on a deeper, more intuitive level. Things are starting to make more sense to you than they were at the beginning of the course, beyond just the specific material you work, but you're starting to get a better sense of just how math works in a personal way. And even if you don't decide to continue on with math, I hope you've started to develop a little bit more of an appreciation for just how cool it is, how many uses it winds up having. This stuff is really great, and it forms the basis so much of the society we have. Just the basis of technology in many ways is mathematics. Plus, I think this stuff is just beautiful and cool for its own stuff just to study it. All right. Uh, we'll see you at educator.com later, and I wish you luck in whatever you wind up doing. Goodbye.